to Fresh Image. Fresh Image is a nonprofit Catholic ministry committed to providing individuals and communities with resources to facilitate the full flourishing of the image of God in each and every single human person. Not only will you find hundreds of articles, convenient audios and presentations on our beautiful faith, but also catechetical resources to be used in the classroom, at the parish, and at the kitchen table. Today, we are happy to present Fresh Image Gospel Reflections from our founder, Tony Crescio. Tony reminds us that it is when we look into the mirror of Scripture that we discover the unique image of God we have each been created to be. My dear friends in Christ, in today's celebration of the 32nd Sunday of Ordinary Time, we find ourselves just two weeks away from the celebration of the Solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, which will draw our liturgical year to a close. Thus, liturgically, what we are experiencing is a movement toward the end for which we were created, eternal participation in the triune dynamics of love, which is our God, through, with, and in the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Accordingly, it is worth dwelling momentarily on the subject of liturgical time before considering the readings for today that the Church, in her wisdom, has selected for us to consider in order to help us navigate these, our final days. Part of the difficulty we face in considering the subject of liturgical time as Christians in a secular and some would call a post-Christian age is, as Orthodox theologian Alexander Schmemann writes, that the Christian year, the sequence of liturgical commemorations and celebrations, ceased to be the generator of power and is now looked upon as a more or less antiquated decoration of religion. How many of us, I wonder, really live out of liturgical time? How many of us even know what liturgical time is? Is it simply for us, as Schmemann says, a more or less antiquated decoration of religion? These questions are of the utmost importance for us as Christians. For if we can't respond by saying, yes, I live out of liturgical time, or at the very least, I strive to live out of liturgical time, we have missed something of the radical transformation that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has brought about in our world. Schmemann explains that through Christ, God reveals and offers us eternal life. And God revealed this eternal life in the midst of time, and of its rush, as its secret meaning and goal. And thus he made time and our work in it into the sacrament of the world to come, the liturgy of fulfillment and ascension. It is the liturgical calendar that marks the ebbs and flows of the sacramentalized existence we live as Christians. Made shares in the life of Christ by the sacrament of baptism, we travel through life with him. Each liturgical year begins by preparing for his birth and advent, celebrating his incarnation during the Christmas season, purging ourselves to participate in his life-giving sacrifice in Lent, experiencing the joy of new life in the Easter season, and persevering in the life he has shared with us through ordinary time. The liturgical calendar marks the dynamics of life with Christ for us, and by asking us to join him on his life's journey, he invites us to deeper conformity and participation in his very life. Only in this way do we have any light in ourselves of which to speak, for there is only one true light of the world, a light which John tells us shines in the darkness of the world, the darkness of our sin-riddled souls, illuminating them as lamps by giving us a share in his life, so that like him, we might be kept safe from being overtaken by the darkness which surrounds and even threatens to destroy us from within. We can consider our readings for today with all of this in mind, and, given what has already been said, I think it best to begin with today's responsorial psalm, Psalm 63. The psalm begins, O God, you are my God whom I seek. For you my flesh pines and my soul thirsts like the earth parched, lifeless and without water. With that, the psalmist thrusts us into the desert. Very much in keeping with this psalm, in his work on the lives of the saints, theologian Lawrence Cunningham rightly notes that within the Christian spiritual tradition, the desert represents a place without God, a place of encounter with evil and malignant spirits, a place of struggle with the disease of sin. Nevertheless, it is also a place where people are led by God. Think here of the episode of Christ's threefold temptation by Satan in the desert, the scriptures introduce that episode by saying that Christ was led there by the Spirit. In imitation of Christ, the desert fathers literally went out into the desert to struggle with the darkness of sin, St. Anthony of Egypt perhaps most famous among them. 
In turn, imitating the desert ascetics, the monastic life attempts to recreate something of a desert setting within the monastery to various degrees, as Cunningham notes. What are the rest of us? In his own commentary on this psalm, Augustine tells us that the desert signifies our life this side of eternity. Thus, in a manner seemingly paradoxical, we are led into the desert, the seemingly godless place of struggle, by God. The reason for this is that the desert is the place where we encounter God most intensely. Here we can call to mind the Israelites, who were set free from captivity in Egypt precisely so that they might worship God in the desert. The likening by Augustine of life this side of eternity to the desert rings true in light of Father Joseph Ratzinger's consideration in part two of his work, Jesus of Nazareth, that God's innermost purpose for creation was to open up a space for response to God's love, to his holy will. In a way, at first it seems odd that the desert would be such a place. But Ratzinger's insight is affirmed in Augustine's reading of the psalm, for Augustine notes that the thirst experienced in the desert naturally leads people to begin searching for a source of water. In the same way, then, the spiritual desert of the world is a space opened up by God that we might be prompted to seek out that which alone can quench the thirst of our souls, our God. Augustine writes, This is the place for thirst. We shall be fully satisfied elsewhere. And immediately, he adds, But even now, God sprinkles upon us the dew of his word to keep us from fainting in this desert. What is this dew of the word, this sustenance given to us by God so that we might traverse the desert of this world? The list could be very long, for whatever communicates the life of Christ to us is this nourishment. However, the sacraments come to mind most readily. The language of dew is a suitable analogy for the waters of baptism, through which we are given a share in the life of Christ, and no less the blood of the Eucharist, through which we literally drink in life itself. This reading aligns well with the words of the psalmist, who tells us in verse 5 that even amidst this desert, as with riches of a banquet, my soul be satisfied, and with exultant lips my mouth shall praise you. With the second half of the verse, Augustine tells us that the psalmist is reminding us that the desert of this life is a time of prayer. Thus, in a certain way, the latter half of the verse refers to the first. For, in the Eucharistic liturgy, the prayer of the church par excellence, our prayers are immediately answered by being filled with the life of Christ in the Eucharist. Yet our liturgical experience is an oasis this side of eternity. And from oasis to oasis, from Eucharist to Eucharist, we struggle to traverse the desert and find ourselves thirsting once again. Drawing an analogy between physical thirst and the beatitude of hungering and thirsting for righteousness, Augustine tells us that it is appropriate to those whose lives seek conformity with Christ to struggle and thirst this side of eternity. This is a key point, for the tradition has often read the beatitudes as characteristics of the very life of Christ. Thus, in part one of his work, Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph Ratzinger writes that, Anyone who reads Matthew's text attentively will realize that the Beatitudes present a sort of veiled interior biography of Jesus, a kind of portrait of his figure. He who has no place to lay his head is truly poor, is truly meek. He is the one who is pure of heart, and so unceasingly beholds God. Consequently, as Christians, living out the Beatitudes denotes an imitation of the life of Christ. If we go one step further and tie in the opening reflection on liturgical time, we can see how Augustine's reflection on the psalm urges us to allow the whole of our lives to become liturgy, a life lived in prayerful unity with God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. In this way, we keep our lamps burning with the life of Christ. It is at this point where the considerations of our first reading for today come into play. There, in chapter 6, verse 12 of the Book of Wisdom, we hear that resplendent and unfading is wisdom, and she is readily perceived by those who love her and found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known in anticipation of their desire. Notice, please, the personalized nature of wisdom here, sought by those who love her and making herself known. Reading passages such as this and others like it, for example, Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 to 31, in light of chapter 1, verse 24 of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the fathers of the church understood wisdom to be Christ. 
Moreover, Augustine used that same verse from Paul to define his understanding of virtue. For the Latin he read said that Christ was the virtue and wisdom of God. For the classical philosophical tradition extending back before the advent of Christ, prudence was typically numbered among the cardinal virtues as it is for many today. Augustine defines this particular virtue in his work, The Catholic and Manichaean Ways of Life, as love discriminating rightly between those things which aid it in reaching God and those things which might hinder it. And then goes on to add that without prudence, the life of virtue in its entirety is impossible. This definition of the virtue of prudence coincides well with our reading from the Book of Wisdom today, which tells us that taking thought of wisdom is the perfection of prudence. And whoever for her sake keeps vigil shall quickly be free from care. At this point, we seem to have thought ourselves into a corner. If it is wisdom that we seek, and wisdom is Christ, and prudence is a virtue, and virtue is also Christ, what gives? Augustine helps us out of our jam. Time and again, he assures us that Christ, the Son of God, who from the beginning was our source and intended end, in his incarnation became the way for us, as he himself teaches such that we come through him to him. Thus we travel by Christ to ever greater unity with Christ, and as we do so, grow in ever greater conformity with Christ. This is an important point because it demonstrates that when it comes to imitating Christ, there is no such thing as authentic imitation that is not participatory. Said differently, imitating Christ is only possible by participating in the life of him who is light, virtue, and wisdom itself. Accordingly, we keep the lamps of our souls lit amid the darkness through virtuous acts of justice, fortitude, temperance, humility, etc. By living in this way, the light of Christ illuminates our path, enabling us to navigate this dark desert and help others to find the way forward as well. This brings us finally to the Gospel reading. There our Lord begins, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. As the parable goes on, Jesus tells us that the foolish virgins took their lamps, but took no oil with them, whereas the wise virgins took the flasks of oil with their lamps. As mentioned above, the soul is the lamp, And what could the oil signify but the very sacraments of the church, which so often use oil to symbolize the conferral of grace, that is, divine life, such as baptism, confirmation, holy orders, and anointing of the sick? In keeping with what has come before, the wise virgins keep their lamps lit by living liturgical lives, nourished by the grace of the sacraments, and stay focused on the coming of Christ by prudently keeping vigil. What's more, they exemplified such a life to the foolish, imprudent virgins who nevertheless failed to imitate their virtuous behavior. Consequently, the foolish virgins fall out of relationship with God, symbolized by the oil of their lamps running out, and they are left unprepared for the coming of the bridegroom. In a rush, they scramble to find some oil and later come to the door, pleading, Lord, Lord, open to us. In response, they hear the soul-wrenching words, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. What is going on here? Is it simply a matter of timing? Perhaps, but this is only part of the story. If it were simply a matter of timing, they would not have been able to even make contact with the bridegroom. More importantly, the imprudent virgins had lost the light of Christ, the light of virtue. Thus, when they scramble to the door in the middle of the night, and our Lord peers through the door to see who is there, the light which illuminates their faces is not that of Christ, but something bought from the world. And for this reason, he says, I do not know you. My friends, this Sunday Jesus calls us to live a liturgical life, a life of participatory imitation of his own life. As we have discussed, this life springs from the sacraments where we receive the oil, the grace to keep the lamp of our souls lit. But liturgical living can't stop there. Rather, it must be extended to every moment of every day by striving to live out the beatitudes and virtues which characterize the life of Christ. For Christians, this is the way to heed the warning issued by Jesus in conclusion of today's parable. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. 
With these cautionary words, Jesus implores us to travel through the desert of this life by the light of virtue, living in continual communion with him as we rush toward our final days. For indeed, the king will come, and what will matter is whether we have lived so as to make his kingdom known and his will done on earth as it is in heaven, through living liturgical lives of virtue. This alone will determine whether he recognizes us or not, and whether or not, therefore, we are welcomed into the eternal banquet of love. Thank you for listening to this week's Gospel Reflection. For more resources, please visit us at freshimage.org. And remember, when you live a fresh life, you will be a breath of God's fresh, life-giving air to the world.